Hey, Bastish B here for 64K and welcome to my new show, One Man and His Machine. So what's this show going to be about? I'm basically going to do little mini profiles on really cool video game programmers, designers or musicians. It's going to be different every single time. Whether these guys were from the classic computer generations from the 80s or the consoles from the 90s, it doesn't matter. It's going to alternate. And today's profile is going to be Manfred Trends, a really prolific Commodore 64 programmer. He has his machine of choice. Let's check out the early years. Manfred Trends is a game designer, graphic artist and programmer born in 1965 in Saarbrücken, Germany and is probably best known for the Turrican game series. But there's a lot more to the story than that. So let's go back to his programming origins in 1984, a year where Frankie Goes to Hollywood could just not stop telling us to relax. The Temple of Doom managed to deliver heart-ripping, monkey-brain-eating child slavery all wrapped up in a neat PG-13 package. And Band-Aid proved that no matter how much talent you throw at something, it doesn't necessarily make it good. But most importantly for this story is that Manfred was introduced to his friend's Commodore VIC-20, where they spent hours messing around with basic programs, getting sprites to do arbitrary animations, and just enjoying the art of coding. The spark was lit. Manfred's passion for programming was immediate, and he absolutely loved it. In 1985, he bought himself a Commodore 64 and went about studying the manual and all the ins and outs of BASIC he could possibly figure out. He made his first game a simple helicopter program similar to the classic Fort Apocalypse to test out all he had learned. It was way too slow and he felt if he wanted to improve his programming, he would actually have to make his own programs for coding because BASIC wasn't going to cut it. He also started to experiment heavily in graphics where he drew some of these background images which would be used in another unreleased shooter game that he was experimenting with at the time. Later that year he met a fellow programmer, Kurt Weiskopf, and they both collaborated on a bunch of demos and graphics. 1986 rolled around and a German Commodore magazine, 64, was having a graphics competition and Manfred sent in a bunch of his stuff, as seen here. He ended up winning third place. But more importantly, he was noticed by a then young software company called Rainbow Arts through the magazine. They immediately contacted him and asked if he'd want to work with them freelance and do some graphics for a bunch of their games. Obviously, he eagerly accepted and managed to get his foot in the door. Little did Rainbow Arts know at the time, but he had become quite a skilled programmer at this point and was about to unleash his first big project. With 1987 rolling around, Around, they made him a permanent member of the team and his first full game was greenlit. Let's stop for a minute and let's take a quick little look at Rainbow Arts, the software company that Manfred was so influential at. Rainbow Arts were a German games publisher founded in 1984 by Mark Ulrich and were defunct in 1999 when they were merged into THQ Deutschland. In their 15 years of existence, they managed to release over 50 games for multiple formats. At the heart of their games publishing were the Commodore 64 and the Amiga, which they flourished in and were able to make countless classics for those systems, like the Great Gianna Sisters, the Turrican series and Catechus amongst many others. They were also a company that got themselves into a lot of legal trouble multiple times over a couple of games designed by Manfred himself which we'll take a look at pretty soon. They were also very adept at gathering some of the best German programmers and musicians under their wing who all went on to their own excellent careers outside of Rainbow Arts. People like game developer Armin Gesset who went on to form Spellbound Entertainment, makers of the Desperado series. Thomas Herzler who ended up founding Blue Bart, makers of the popular Settlers series, and musician Chris Hulsbeck, who's had a remarkable video game soundtrack career from the 1980s to now with many C64 and Amiga classics, as well as modern and successful Kickstarter anthology albums. And of course, their star programmer himself, Manfred Trenz, whose body of work at Rainbow Arts came to define the company as a whole. And that's the cue to move on to the games. So Manfred Trenz is responsible for so many games in the late 80s and early 90s that I just absolutely love. One in there is Catechus, excellent scroll and shoot 'em up. So let's jump back into his back catalogue and check out my personal favourite games. First up is the 1987 platform game, 
the Great Gianna Sisters, which was Manfred's first full product as game level and graphics designer, with Chris Hulsbeck providing a wonderful score for the game. The overall result is an excellent adventure in the Super Mario Bros. tradition. If you look past the first few levels, which are almost exact replicas of Super Mario Bros. on the NES, it's an amazingly well designed and fleshed out platform experience. It did unfortunately catch the all-seeing eye of Nintendo, who threatened a legal battle if the game wasn't recalled. Rainbow Arts basically had to comply, which makes physical copies of this one go for such insane prices. Luckily for most C64 owners, the cracking groups of the 80s made sure everyone would get a chance to play this awesome game. 1988 saw the release of Catechus, a side-scrolling shoot-em-up. The graphics and music in this game are absolutely fantastic, and it plays brilliantly in two-player co-op as well. Manfred headed up coding on this one, with Hulsbeck providing another amazing Sid soundtrack. Manfred's love for referencing games that he liked, like the Gianna sisters, got Rainbow Arts into trouble once again, as the roving eye of Activision was not to please the Catechus, which was an obvious homage to R-Type. Activision, who had the R-Type home license at the time, gave them an ultimatum. Code the C64 version for them in six and a half weeks for its release date, or we'll sue. Catechus was quickly recalled, renamed Denerys, with some changes to make the R-Type references less obvious and re-released. Which leads us to Manfred's other 1988 six and a half week conversion of the R-Type arcade game to the Commodore 64, which by all accounts should never have been possible, but it turned out excellent and is a fantastic port of the classic RM arcade game. Graphics, sound effects and another unforgettable opening tune by Hillsbeck round out another must play in a C64 back catalog. 1990 gave us the running gun marvel that is Turrican, which is one of the C64's best games in this genre. Another absolutely groundbreaking programming feat which shouldn't have been possible for the system to handle, but Manfred made it happen. He performed coding and graphics, and Hulsbeck, Hartwick and Baker provided a memorable soundtrack to the sublime Shinma platformer. Countless different versions of this game were made, but this still is the true original. 1991 gave us the all-out madness that is Turrican 2, which pushes the system further with bigger levels, scrolling shoot 'em up segments and massive bosses, and an all-round excellent running gun platforming gameplay experience. Programming was done by Manfred, graphics by him and Andreas Escher, and yet another amazing Amazing Sid soundtrack, this time by Marcus Siebold. 1992 was a busy year for him with the release of Enforcer, Full Metal Mega Blaster on the C64, which was a scrolling shoot 'em up tour de force. Amazing graphics, and another game that melts every single chip in the C64 as you play it. Manfred did the graphics and coding with Marcus Siebold, again busting out a rocking soundtrack that had absolutely no bad tracks across the entire game. This is a must play shooter, and unfortunately, it was Manfred's last C64 game. Also in 1992, he did a remix of Turrican 1 and 2 on the NES, known as Super Turrican, which he not only programmed, but also did the graphics, music, and sound effects. So he basically one man this crazy port, which is really quite an impressive game on the NES. And one of the last of my favorite games that I wanted to highlight is 1995 Super Famicom only release of Rendering Ranger, which blows my mind that this game was never released outside of Japan. The game mashes Contra and Turrican together for this visual explosion that is well worth the effort to track it down and is possibly his least known game which is an absolute crime. So what has he been up to since he's left the Commodore 64 scene? Well, in 1999, THQ announced that they were working on Turrican 3D, which Manfred was spearheading with a large production team. Unfortunately, the game was cancelled after two years of development. It was supposedly heading for the PC with a rumored Dreamcast version as well. THQ ended up cancelling the game in late 2000 without any real reason given. In 2004, Manfred founded the software company Denerys Software Entertainment, where he proceeded to release many console and handheld games for the PS1, Game Boy Color, Nintendo DS, etc, etc. Roughly seven or so games were released through the company, with only CT Special Forces on the Game Boy Advance that I would honestly say is worth playing. It's a typical game in the Manfred style, where the inspiration is clearly obvious, aka Metal Slug, and it's a really cool game to check out. And that wraps it up. I just want to do a quick shout out to the Manfred Trends fan page. I got a lot of really good information from there. Uh, some of it's in English, some of it's in German, so you have to muddle your way through it if you don't know German. I'll put a link in the description. There's a lot of cool information there to check out. And thanks for joining me, Bastish B at 64K. If you could like and subscribe, that would be greatly appreciated. Cut to credits. Hey, Beth.
Master Spear for 64K and welcome to another episode of One Man and His Machine. And today's episode is about Paul Norman, a really talented Commodore 64 creator, programmer and musician. This is his machine of choice. Let's check out the early years. Paul Norman is an American musician and video game programmer who was very successful in his craft on the Commodore 64 during the 1980s. As a kid, Paul loved listening to movie soundtracks and classical music such as the likes of Chopin or Tchaikovsky, which becomes very evident in his later work. At 13, he taught himself how to play the guitar, and by 1970, he had become a professional musician and composer and played lead guitar, among other things, in numerous bands and concerts. With the rise of the popular disco genre of music in the late 70s to early 80s, Paul found it harder and harder to find steady work and was looking for an extra means of income and creative freedom that was becoming difficult to maintain simply being a musician. 1982 rolled around and Paul bought himself a Commodore VIC-20 and taught himself BASIC and made a couple of simplistic games. He noticed an advert in the newspaper that same year that was looking for programmers to join a company called Synchro. They were a small business that was at the time making games for the Apple II and VIC-20 market but wanted to expand to the newly released Commodore 64 audience. Paul showed up for his interview and showed them his VIC-20 games and was hired on the spot. They gave him a Commodore 64 and asked if he knew machine language. He lied and said he did. Paul now worked at Synchro. They asked him to make a rudimentary game with a guy with a bow and arrow. Paul agreed and started teaching himself the language as well as program his first game for commercial release. About three quarters of the way through programming, Synchro was bought out by a new company called Cosme. Synchro's office location was shut down and a handful of employees were kept on as Cosme had plans to enter the video game market as well. Paul was retained and continued to work on his then almost complete first game. All further work on the game took place at his house as Cosme never had any real offices. The company was basically George Johnson's house in Pasadena who was the owner. By this time it had just ticked over to 1983 and Paul's first game was finally ready. So now we're going to have a look at all Paul's games, everything he worked on at Cosme from 1983 to 1989, all 14 of his Commodore 64 releases. 1983 saw the release of Paul's first game with Cosme, titled Forbidden Forest. And although the genre hadn't really been invented yet, playing this now in retrospect, it's clearly a survival horror game. Armed with simply a bow and arrow, you have to survive, kill all manner of beasts and creatures in this haunted forest. Play it at night with the lights off and pump that music and you'll be totally creeped out. The music is a real star yeah, being so relentlessly ominous to the point of sending chills down your spine and the excellent use of graphics, especially the gruesome death animations make you want to survive as long as possible. The gameplay was simple, the music and the graphics are as cinematic as a 1983 game could possibly get. It was brilliant. The game went on to sell hundreds of thousands of copies and is still a great C64 game to track down. 1983's other gem was Aztec Challenge, which was supposed to be a simple port of an already released side-scroller on the Atari 8-bit computers. But Paul had other ideas. He decided on his own accord to completely remake the game, bigger and better and more cinematic in his own style. And thus the C64 gem was created. The game now had seven levels of unique gameplay that required razor sharp reactions to survive its entire run. Again using different camera angles for most of the levels, giving the game a kind of movie-like look and the musical score that builds itself up as you play and is totally unforgettable. This is another classic to the C64 library and should not be confused with the mediocre Atari versions. 1984's Caverns of Kafka was another example of a game being converted from an Atari 8-bit computer and Paul decided again on making it a completely new game. Unfortunately this time around it's just a bit of a mess. Just trying to navigate yourself around in this game is ridiculously bad and the whole thing just feels like an unfinished game. The music and sound effects try to save it but they simply just can't do it. I can see the attempt at trying to make some sort of Indiana Jones adventure here but the whole thing just falls apart gameplay wise. Maybe it would have been a better idea just to do a direct port. Which actually leads to his quick turnaround direct port of Slinky to the C64 in 1984 as well. Slinky was one of those knockoff games that were rampant in the early 80s. Space Invaders and Pac-Man were massive victims of this. And in Slinky's case, the arcade game Cubert was the game they were ripping off. It's actually a pretty decent little arcade romp for what it is. Nothing memorable though. In 1985 we got Trivia Monster, a game that Paul was not too fond of and was asked to make by the Cosme higher-ups. They wanted a trivia game 
game to compete with the extremely popular Trivial Pursuit at the time, hence Trivial Monster. I honestly think it's pretty fun if you like this type of game, with the added bonus of being murdered by a monster if you guess too many questions wrong. Beyond the Forbidden Forest was next and is obviously a sequel to the Forbidden Forest. It's a well made creepy sequel to a classic game. The foreboding atmosphere is back, as is the frantic gameplay with some clever graphical touches and some awesome monsters. It's a pretty good sequel that's not quite as good as the first but still well worth checking out if you didn't get creeped out enough by the original. And the final game for 85 was Super Huey, another game that the Cosme bosses wanted Paul to make. They wanted some sort of simulation game. He said he would only do it if he could make a helicopter simulation because he was a massive fan of the movie Blue Thunder and the TV show Airwolf. They agreed and Super Huey was made. It's a pretty good helicopter flight sim for the time and has some cool music and some interesting missions but I think the game was forgotten pretty quickly as in 1986 Microprose's Gunship came out and pretty much made all simulators at the time look like a joke in comparison. Super Huey though is still a well made game. 1986 continued Paul's new fascination with simulator style games with DEFCON 5, a strategy nuclear war simulator which was no doubt inspired by the 1983 movie War Games. I never had the instructions for this game as a kid and having a pirated copy so this game was almost unplayable but I think it could be very interesting in its ultra cold war realistic style. This was a pretty different game from Paul and is definitely worth trying if you can get your hands on some instructions that is. Super Huey 2 was next and it almost feels like a modern day DLC pack for the 80s. I found the missions actually to be a lot more fun than the original. If you like the first one you're gonna enjoy it but if not it's not gonna win you over as it's mostly the same game as before. Overall though it's still quite cool. 1987 saw Paul do some graphic work only on another Cosme title named Top Fuel Challenge which is not to be confused with Activision's own Top Fuel Eliminator They came out the same year both featuring drag racing. It was an okay I guess simulator. His other game that year which was a full Paul Norman production however was Chernobyl, the nuclear power plant simulator. Uh, yes. And you thought some of these new games like Job Simulator were weird. This puts you in the shoes of a worker at a nuclear power plant, running the reactor and making sure it doesn't go critical. I don't even know what to say about it. <laughs> it's a bizarre yet mundanely realistic game. Or is it a game? I'm not even sure to be honest. <laughs> Only in the 80s I guess. 1988 saw two more games. First is a game he co-created called Navcom 6 The Persian Gulf Defense that is a navy cruise simulator. It kind of feels a bit like an unfinished game, it's just way too small and I simply can't recommend it. But 88's other game which Paul created solo was called The President is Missing which is a very unique detective style game where you have to figure out who has kidnapped the president and you are an investigator and you have to go through mountains of info and photos and stuff to figure it all out. It could probably be considered an investigator simulator. <laughs> it's a good game but again it's not gonna appeal to everyone and instructions are an absolute must if you attempt to play it. The game did win an award at CES 1988 for the most original game. It was followed up by a sequel also released by Cosme called Presumed Guilty where Paul contributed to graphics and story. And now on to Paul's final game for Cosme 1989 Navy SEAL, which you guessed it, is a Navy SEAL simulator, putting you in the seat of a SEAL performing various missions or training exercises. It's a decent game, nowhere near as good as something like Microprose's Airborne Ranger, but it tries. It's a collection of mini games, I do like the variety, it's pretty tough though. But interesting, Paul later said that coding Navy SEAL on the C64 was the most funny he had programming any game. So you're probably wondering, what did Paul do after 1989? Let's take a quick little brief look at his further career. Paul worked with Cosme up until 1989 and after that he decided to leave over a multitude of reasons such as money, programming burnout and wanting to work on the new PC systems of the time amongst many other things. In the early 90s he joined Targa Media and worked on a number of games as either audio, music producer or script writer. He then moved on and worked at Sega for two years as a design consultant and is credited for working on the Genesis version of Home Alone 2. After that he moved on to website design in the late 90s and made a few sites for various companies. He also later helped design a site which teaches people how to play music. And if you want to find out more information about Paul himself you should check out his own personal website called Digitarius. It looks like it was made in the late 90s or early 
2000s. It's got a real retro vibe, which is kind of cool. It's a wealth of information on the man himself, his music, and his gaming history. Overall though, Paul's love of music and movies more than games is why his creations always had cinematic overtones. Coupled with the fact that he wasn't really a gamer himself, meant he wasn't really influenced by other designers, making his collection of games quite unique in every sense. You may be wondering what ever happened to Cosme? Well, they still exist to this day, believe it or not. They've outlived a whole bunch of really massive software companies and still around. These days though, they are more uh, what you would call shovelware distributors. <laughs> they make PC games and they also do shovelware games. You know, they've been of games for your PC that you always see at every Walmart in the corner there that you can go through and get them, buy them for like five bucks each or something. That's Cosme. They're actually one of the biggest companies in the world that produce and distribute these things. Also in the early 2000s, they decided to update a few of Paul's classic games. They made Super Huey 3 and Forbidden Forest. Just don't go looking for those. <laughs> Trust me, you're gonna be uh, very disappointed. Just pretend they don't exist and just stick to the originals. And if you're still interested about more information about Cosme, you can check them out here. And that's it. Thanks for joining me, Bastish B at 64K. I hope you had a good time. If you can like and subscribe, that'll be greatly appreciated. And I'll see you next time. Cheers. Hey, Bastish B here for 64K, and welcome to another episode of One Man and His Machine. And today's profile is about Kenji Ino, a Japanese game designer and musician. These were his machines of choice. Let's check out the early years. Kenji Ino was born in 1970 in Arakawa, Tokyo, Japan, and he was a pretty gung-ho video game designer and musician. His games were kinda unorthodox and didn't fit neatly in with anything else. For English fans, he's probably best remembered as helping pioneer this survival horror genre of games, where he created some really interesting and unique titles. He was also a musician and produced soundtracks for many of his own games and for other people, starting on the Famicom all the way up to the Dreamcast and beyond. He was a well-known electronic musician in Japan and released several albums, as well as founded multiple video game companies. The most well-known of his was Warp. But before we start looking at everything in detail, let's jump back to the beginning. Even as a kid, Kenji loved video games. He was reclusive and video games brought him comfort. He spent a lot of time at the local arcades as well and cited Space Invaders and Pac-Man as being the games that made him want to join the industry. He created his first game, Toadoko Murder Case, and entered it in a local video game competition. It didn't place first, but was received favorably. He then dropped out of high school and decided that gaming was what he wanted to do. His first real industry job was for a Japanese company called Interlink. They were not well known outside of Japan and made the 1989 strategy game Moulin Rouge War Chronicle and many more obscure Famicom games. Kenji was hired based on his game Toadoko Murder Case, but he had no real programming skill, at least with modern software or computers. He almost got fired immediately until he told him he was a musician as well, and he ended up working in their sound department, where he headed up design as well as sound, but ultimately was unsatisfied working there because he wanted more control over the games he was making and eventually left in 1989 to form its first company, ERM Limited, with the idea to have complete creative freedom on the games he was making. He saw an opportunity in the industry to focus the company on making sequels or spin-offs to popular games so that the big companies could continue on and make new RPs. EIM ended up being pretty successful, but inadvertently he had made himself a slave once again to his clients' wishes and was forced to follow their ideas for the most part. A lot of Famicom and NES games were produced during this short lifespan where Kenji contributed to design and music like Time Zone, Casino Kid 2, and most notably to Western audiences was Panic Restaurant on the NES, which has become really sought after and expensive. With his disillusion over the industry growing daily, he decided to shut down EIM in 1992 and change careers and worked as a consultant in the automotive industry for the next two years. but his passion for gaming was reignited when he attended Macworld 94 convention and a couple of others that year and was amazed at the advancements in CD-ROM technology could bring to games. He decided to form a new company called Warp, 
and was particularly enamored with Panasonic's 3DO system, formed a small but very talented team made up of, amongst others, Fumito Ueda, who later worked on Eco and Shadow of the Colossus on the PS2, Takeshi Nozoe, who ended up working on Final Fantasy VII Advent Children, and Ichiro Itano of Macross fame. Starting in 1994, they produced a lot of weird and unorthodox games for the Japanese 3DO market, including Short Walk and Oyaji Hunter Mayon. But the big success was a game called called D, released on the 3DO and Sega Saturn in 1995. It was a huge hit on both systems and helped calm Kenji's mental health, which was all over the place at the time. He had also just gotten married during the creation of D and the 3DO had basically been deemed a failure as a system and was discontinued. Fortunately, D was the saving grace and the Sega Saturn in Japan was hugely successful and D became an instant cult classic and financial success. And we'll be looking at all these major games in more detail in the game section later on in the video. He then signed a contract with Sony to port D to the PS1. 100,000 pre-orders were agreed upon for production, but Sony apparently only printed 40,000 and left many people without a way to get the game. Sony placed other games higher on their production list, even though a deal had been made. Kenji later found out that the real print run was even lower, with less than 28,000 produced, and was furious, especially considering they were a small company with a massive hit game. Every unit was really important to him. He felt betrayed and in 1996 he signed a multi-game deal with Sony's direct rival Sega and publicly denounced Sony at a Japanese press conference by revealing his new game was going to be a Sega Saturn exclusive by morphing the PlayStation logo into the Saturn one during the presentation. Sony was humiliated and all ties with them were severed. In 1996 saw the release of Enemy Zero on the Saturn, another game similar to D but with an added first person survival aspect. Again, a really unique and original game that wasn't as successful financially as D, but it's a damn good game nevertheless. In 1997, we saw his strangest game released called Real Sound on the Saturn. It was also ported to the Dreamcast in 1999. It was a game made for blind gamers. Kenji apparently received many letters from blind gaming fans claiming to love his games due to the rich soundscape they all had and therefore without visuals they could still follow most of his games. Kenji was pretty moved by this and decided one of his games in his Sega contract was going to be for the blind and asked Sega to donate 1000 satins with the game to blind gamers. They agreed and yet another unique game from Kenji was born. It was a visual novel styled game where you could play the whole game without ever looking at the screen. The sound told the story. The following year in 1998 he did the soundtrack to the Dreamcast racing game Sega Rally 2 and worked closely with Yu Suzuki who he later said was really helpful to him in the making of his final big game, D2, the sequel to the original D that was made for the Dreamcast in 1999. Although Laura the character also appeared in Enemy Zero, this was considered the true sequel to D. It took the form of an excellent third-person action-adventure game with strong story elements and some of the D-style first-person exploration and was a really fantastic entry in the survival horror genre. Despite the top quality of all these games, the sales were a bit sluggish in the West and Kenji decided to close down Warp in 2000. Okay, so this is usually the part of the show where I run through every single game that a person made, but I've specifically mentioned all his earlier stuff in the little insert you saw earlier. I did that on purpose because I really want to focus on three games. These are three games that I think are really excellent and unique and strangely bizarre in some sort of reason that only Kenji Ino could have brought to the table. So let's check out these three gems. D was released in 1995 on the 3DO and a few months later on the Sega Saturn and can be best described as a horror interactive movie. The game was in development for a year and all the graphic FMV sequences were made using Amiga 4000 computers. Kenji said in an interview that D would not exist if it wasn't for the text adventure series Transylvania that was released in 1984 on the Apple II. Commodore 64, DOS and various other computers. He said the pacing, story and atmosphere was the building block for D. The story for the game involves a character named Laura who appears in all three of the D trilogy of games we're going to look at here although each game is its own self-contained experience. She finds out that her father has murdered a whole bunch of people and barricaded himself in an old hospital. She goes to try to find out what happened, but when she enters the hospital, it transforms into a gothic castle and she's stuck in there with no choice 
choice but to continue further with the hope of finding him. Explaining any more of the story is definitely a spoiler but rest assured by the end it's a pretty bizarre and fascinating conclusion. You move around through FMV sequences and interact with objects and puzzles all the while finding out more about your father and your own past. The game's not massive and you have a two hour time limit. There's also multiple endings depending on some crucial choices at the end as well as there's no save option. It's do or die. Kenji was afraid the game was going to get censored when he submitted it to the ratings board so he actually gave them a version of the game with all the disturbing stuff cut out. They approved the game and Kenji then delivered the uncensored version to the manufacturers for production. Hence the reason we have this game in all its creepy glory. The game was a massive hit in Japan selling over a million copies on the Saturn and was the most successful game the 3DO ever had. So much so that it got a re-released director's cut called Dee's Diner which had a a few extra scenes and a soundtrack CD. Overall I love this game's look and feel, the slow creepy pace with excellent use of subtle music and sound effects. The game's not too long and the puzzles are just the right degree of challenging. It's well worth checking it out as an early example, at least atmosphere wise, of the survival horror genre. If you're unable to get hold of a PS1, 3DO or Saturn version to play, then the MS-DOS version was re-released and is available on Steam and GOG. And next is 1996 Sega Saturn gem Enemy Zero which was also released on Windows in 1998. The game had a pretty quick 9 month development cycle and this time silicone graphics workstations were used for the FMV visuals. The English version also sports Laura's voice being done by Jill Cuniff of the 90s rock band Luscious Jackson and the soundtrack this time was done by Michael Nyman, the award winning composer of the movie The Piano and the super underrated sci-fi classic Gattaca. Kenji was a massive fan of his composition and on a visit to Japan, which Nauman was donating pianos after the 1995 earthquake in Kobe, Kenji was able to get a meeting with him and managed to convince him to do the soundtrack for the game. He has Kenji's own words on the encounter. When I found out he was in Japan, I invited him back to my hotel room and tried to convince him for six hours to come work with me. So at the end, Michael was like, okay, okay, I'll do it. Just let me go back to my room. So he went back exhausted after being convinced for six hours. We he didn't work out terms or conditions, he just said he would do it. Plot wise it's got elements from the Aliens movies where Laura wakes up after having her hyper sleep disrupted to find out that the ship is infested with aliens. So she tries to go find out what's going on, all the while trying to find the escape pod to leave the ship. It features two different gameplay styles. The first is the FMV investigation stuff where all the plot and puzzles are solved. And the second is a first person mechanic where running or defending yourself from the aliens is imperative. Did I mention that the aliens are invisible? No? Well, yeah, they are. <laughs> so you have to rely on sound to figure out where they are and when to shoot. This is one of the most coolest and stressful things I've ever experienced in a game and it works brilliantly and pumps up the survival horror aspect tenfold. The game's way bigger than D and has save points. The investigation aspect is very cool with excellent use of FMV and atmosphere building. The music and sound effects are haunting and the sound effects are particularly important to gameplay. Many of the characters you meet here are also in D2 even though like I said earlier they are unconnected story wise. The game again was extremely popular in Japan but didn't do that well in the rest of the world due to the Saturn's already dwindling popularity in those regions which is a real shame. Not only did Japan get the full Michael Nauman soundtrack but also the only 20 copies of the special edition were made costing roughly $2,000 each with the bonus of Kenji himself and delivering the copy to you personally. And now onto the final game I wanted to highlight and the last in the official D trilogy called D2 which was released in 1999 on the Sega Dreamcast and was the last game made in Kenji's multi Sega game contract and Warp's last game. It was originally being developed for Panasonic's M2 console the follow up to the 3DO but the console was eventually cancelled and the whole production moved over to Sega's new Dreamcast and turned out for me at least to be one of my top 10 favourite games on that system. The plot this time definitely has threads of John Carpenter's The Thing and has you again as Laura whose plane is getting taken over by terrorists as a meteorite hits the plane sending it crashing into the frozen Canadian wilderness. Not only is it a game of survival horror with many of the passengers being mutated by the meteor 
but it's also a survival game with hunting for food being a necessity to surviving. But it's also got the aspect of exploration, just like the previous games which takes place once you enter buildings or locations. The action also takes place in these RPG style encounters where you earn experience for killing monsters which upgrade your health. This game is just cool on so many levels. Kenji's awesome music score the frantic but extremely satisfying combat sequences, the puzzle solving aspect, the excellent hunting mechanic, and the crazy awesome story that has you glued to your seat, wondering what's going to happen next. If you ever manage to get to the end boss, then Enemy Zero fans can attest to probably one of the most unique boss fights I've ever encountered. A friend once described this game to me as an indie movie made into a game, and it's pretty accurate. It's strange and offbeat and is an excellent addition to the survival horror genre, which has some really excellent graphics, sound and game design. The game garnered mostly positive reviews in Japan and worldwide, with Japan receiving four different cover version releases. The game is only available on the Dreamcast, with the English version being slightly censored in one of the opening scenes involving tentacles. This was another gem from Kenji and is my personal favorite of the D series and as a game, as a Dreamcast fan, you should definitely try it if you haven't already. Ready. So you're probably wondering what ever happened to Kenji Ino after 1999's D2. After the demise of Warp, Kenji opened Super Warp in the late 2000s but never actually produced any games and worked with the Japanese cell phone company Docomo on various applications and other marketing jobs. Super Warp was eventually disbanded in 2005. His real return to gaming would only come in late 2009 when he released the puzzle game You, Me and the Cubes on the Wii downloadable service WiiWare. It was received quite well and the game was very popular. He then moved on and made various cell phone games for the Japanese gaming market. Unfortunately, in February 20th, 2013, Kenji was found dead in his apartment. The cause of death was hypertension, which is a heart attack brought on by major stress. He was only 42 years old. Family and colleagues were shocked and we lost one of the most unique game designers and musicians of recent years. At least for Kenji, his games and music will always live on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I hope you enjoyed that little profile on Kenji Ino. He was a really unique person and game designer. I hope it inspires you to go check out some of his older work. It's really good stuff. Thanks for joining me, Bastish B at 64K. I hope you had a good time. And if you could like and subscribe, that'll be greatly appreciated. And I'll see you next time. Cheers. Hey, Bastish B here for 64K and welcome to another episode of One Man and His Machine. And today's profile is on Chris Butler, a very talented 80s Commodore 64 programmer. This was his machine of choice. Let's check out the early years. Chris Butler is a UK video game programmer most fondly remembered for his arcade conversions to the Commodore 64. But there's a lot more to the story than that. So let's jump back to 1983 where Chris had one of his first games published by Softspot, a small UK software company. The game in question was called Transistor's Revenge for the BBC Micro. He released a few other small titles through them, but Chris realized pretty quickly that the BBC Micro was not the future, at least for hungry programmers trying to make a living. It was around 1984 that Chris watched an expose on British software house Imagine Software and the money and lifestyles the programmers were enjoying in the wake of Imagine's massive success. Despite the company's implosion, Ocean now owned the name and Chris decided to apply to an advert the company published looking for new programmers. Here's what Chris had to say about the encounter. What kind of salary are you going to offer me? And they said five grand. I could get more by working in a bank in Southend. And so ended his brief encounter with Imagine. Chris eventually settled at the small UK software house Alligator in early 1984. Alligator had only been around since 83 at that point, but had built up a solid amount of decent titles in a short amount of time. On all the major 8-bit computer systems at the time, like the BBC Micro, Spectrum, C64 and Amstrad, they are probably best remembered for programmer Anthony Crowther's early games such as Blagger and Loco. 
Chris had a lot of programming experience with the BBC Micro, but it was decided he'd move on to the C64, as it was selling like hotcakes, and Alligator wanted a piece of the cake. Chris found the transition to programming on it fairly easy, as both machines shared a similar architecture for programming. Four months later, Chris's first game for Alligator was released on the C64, called Hop Circuit, and it was based on one of his earlier BBC games, Transistor's Revenge. Chris's second game for them took him five months to complete, and was released at the beginning of 1985. It was called Zed, a really fast-paced shoot-em-up that showed off his programming talents with fast and frantic scrumming gameplay and sprat overloads. People started to take notice. At this point, after two relatively successful games, Alligator just simply couldn't afford to keep Chris around anymore, and he was off to find a new publisher to work with. He shopped around at a few companies like Ocean and Activision but ended up settling at Elite, who gave him the best deal. It was late 1985 at this point, and Elite had just acquired the license to Commando based on the Capcom arcade game. Unfortunately, Elite wanted the game to ship for Christmas, and that gave Chris 8 weeks to make the game from start to finish, which was a mammoth undertaking. But he did it, and he delivered the C64 version on time, and according to Chris, one of his levels was completely removed from the game once Rob Hubbard was on board for the music. Rob needed 6k for the Commando theme, so the elite higher ups decided to axe level 4 from the game, hence Commando's 3 levels. Everything worked out perfectly though in the end. The game was number 1 in the charts for December 1985, and the Rob Hubbard scores become a bona fide Sid classic. Chris later said about it, it made Christmas number 1, and made me a small fortune. 1986 rolled around, and Elite were so pleased with the Commando results that they gave him another Capcom license they got, Ghosts and Goblins. But this time he had 5 months to complete the game. When asked about doing arcade conversions, he said, I'm quite happy doing arcade conversions. It's dead easy work. Ghosts and Goblins was another C64 smash hit, and Elite were over the moon with the results. Chris received many offers from other software houses after the success of Commando and Ghosts, but he decided to stick with Elite for now, as they had just got a new license, and Chris couldn't resist the challenge of converting the Sega Arcade Space Harrier to the humble C64. The magazines and industry insiders thought the task was impossible to make it run on the machine. Chris proved them wrong. Space Harrier was released in 1987 and sold really well. The reviews at the time were really mixed, but in my opinion he did a bang up job on the game. When asked if he would ever do an original game again after all these arcade conversions, he simply said, The thing is, that so much is involved in writing an original game. It's not just programming, there's actual game design as well. And game design is the one thing I'm not very good at. Next was another conversion of sorts of battleships to the C64 based on the classic board game. The game was actually held back for a year after completion and was released on the Encore label, which was Elite's new budget line of games. The game was received really well and garnered rave reviews at the time. At this point, Chris decided to leave Elite and go freelance. When asked if he had ever want to write a movie license game, he responded, I wouldn't really want to, no. But you know, unless it was purely for financial gain, then I would. It was plain to see that despite his incredible programming skills, making games was a job for him. Not so much a passion, but something he just knew how to do really well. As this quote proved, I wouldn't write a game solely for the pleasure of writing a game. I'm a commercial software writer. Full stop. There's no doubt about it. And with that, Chris settled at the UK software developer US Gold and converted the Atari skateboarding arcade game to the C64, 720 degrees. It was another well-received and commercially successful game, and that rounded out 1987. Next up was a Sega arcade game that the US Gold had just licensed and Chris wanted a shot at it. The game in question was Thunderblade, and another game like Space Area, where the press sniggered at the thought of it being converted to the C64 successfully. Chris decided to take up the challenge, and the game was eventually released in 1989 to mixed reviews, but again sold really well. And when asked about his process for converting these giant arcade games, he simply said, I always try to capture what it is about the subject matter that attracts the game player. And with that, it was time to move on. Software manager for US Gold at the time, Charles Cecil, decided to defect to Activision, and Chris decided to tail along for the ride. He was looking for his next big title, and he got it at Activision. They gave him 8 months to convert the behemoth Sega arcade racer Power Drift to the C64. This is what Chris had to say about the opportunity. The license for Power Drift surfaced soon after. I wanted a big title to work.
work on, and it was all that was available. Eight months later, Power Drift was complete and was released in early 1990 to rave reviews and much acclaim. Chris was at an all-time high, having many successful conversions back to back. His bravado and straightforwardness did sometimes get him into hot water with his fellow peers, as seen by his response about other programmers he admired. Archie McLean is a good programmer. Steve Evans is good. Braybrook? Uh, I'm not too sure about. His games look good, but I don't know. Crowther's a bit past it. Paul Wokes is good, but he's a bit of a black horse. He definitely spoke his mind, which maybe a lot of people didn't appreciate at the time. And so rolled on his next game for Activision, 1990's conversion of Ninja Spirit to the C64 based on the RM arcade game. This was a much more straightforward conversion, but Chris threw everything at it, resulting in another top-notch conversion and a game that reviewed extremely well at the time. In that same year, UK software house System 3 released the game called Vendetta which was a mixture of the last ninja and a racing game. But the driving sections in the game people really really seemed to respond to. System 3 decided to expand the concept and turn those manic driving sections into a full game unto itself. After the massive success of Power Drift, they felt Chris was the man for the job. He joined up with them and the result was 1991's sublime racing destruction game Turbo Charge, which seemed to use all Chris's 3D speed and racing programming techniques he had mastered over the years and put it into a single game. It was another big hit and garnered rave reviews across the board in all the C64 magazines at the time. When asked how long the C64 had at this point, he said, there is a good few years of C64 games to come. Yes, 16-bit is interesting, but there's life in this old dog yet. Chris's final game for the C64 came one year later in 1992 for Zeppelin Games called Arnie, which was an asymmetric styled running gun game in the same mold as Commando. It was a great little game that again garnered great reviews, but it was kind of a strange end to his C64 legacy going out on an original game and a budget one as well. After this, information is pretty vague on Chris's career but we'll look at the last known credits of his work that ends in 2001. In 1993 and 94, Chris was the lead programmer in two pretty well received System 3 Super Nintendo games, namely Putty and Putty Squad. Then there's a bit of a gap on his resume until 1998 when he's credited on Crime Killer, a pretty decent 3D racing destruction game on PC and PS1. I used to have this and played it quite a lot, it was pretty enjoyable. This was followed by 1998's GT Interactive release of War of the Worlds and followed lastly by his swan song the Italian job in 2001 on the PS1 and PC again and maybe Chris finally got his financial reward for doing a movie license game after all. And I'll finish this off with a quote by Chris when asked if being a programmer has all been worth it. He said, undoubtedly, I still love writing games. It's a boy's dream after all. And me straight out of school, a dream career, even if I'm not incredibly wealthy. So you're probably wondering, whatever happened to Chris Butler after the 2000s? Well that's a pretty hard question to answer. He has remained extremely elusive, just like another C64 programmer, Stavros Vassalis. Okay, I was able to find a few credits for Chris Butler after 2000. There's a game called Railworks that came out in 2009. He's credited as working on that. It's one of those railroad simulator games. And 2012, Need for Speed Most Wanted has his name in the credit. Now, whether this is the original Chris Butler from back in the 80s or whether it's just somebody else with the same name, it, Chris Butler is not exactly a you know, an uncommon name, you know, talking about something weird. So I'm not 100% sure whether this is the Chris Butler. I'll be interested to know if anybody, uh, if anybody has any other information, please leave it in the comments or let us know uh, what he's been up to in the last 10 years, especially because it's just, you know, trail runs cold, actually it runs cold in 2000. These are just two things that I just managed to find. It's not really confirmed, there's no interviews, there's no nothing, so whether he just retired or went into like the fallout shelter with Stavros Vassalos and they're both working on some sort of magical C64 game that's coming out next year. <laughs> So obviously the sources of information were few and far between, like I've mentioned many times. 
I just want to acknowledge that there were two interviews from Zap64 magazines, one from 1985 and one from 1989 that were extremely useful. I gleaned a lot of information from that and also from a few other little sources across the internet. The information about him is sparse at best, but if you want a little bit more information about Chris, check out these two issues of Zap64. Both those have the interviews and are well worth reading. Okay, thanks for joining me, Bassish B at 64K. I hope you enjoyed that little profile. If you can like and subscribe, they'll be greatly appreciated, and I'll see you next time. Cheers. Hey, Bastish B here for 64K, and welcome to another episode of One Man and His Machine. And today's profile is on Trevor Story a game designer, graphic and concept artist, and the driving force behind Icon 64. This is his machine of choice. Let's get to know the man a little bit better. Trevor Story hails from Newcastle, England, and is a cover artist, concept artist, 2D and 3D video game artist and game designer. He has been working in the industry for over 30 years with close to 100 games to his credit, working on games for big companies such as Team 17, Ocean, US Gold, Iguana Entertainment, just to name a few, with titles such as Shadow Man 1 and 2, Robin Hood Defender of the Crown, Forsaken, never mind all the C64 titles like Barnsley Badger and Shadow of a Hawksmill, and so much more we're going to have a look at today in this video. He's also a very skilled concept artist with work covering album covers, book, movie and TV, game covers, magazine covers, but in this video we'll be focusing on his work put out by himself and a few core members of Icon 64 and all the games they have released during the 2010s on the Commodore 64. So today we're going to be having a look at all the games that Trevor Story has put out in the modern C64 era. Everything from 2012 right up to the end of 2020, it's roughly about 22 games or so on the Commodore 64. I reached out to Trevor himself and he was kind enough to grant me an interview for this video so you'll not only be hearing my opinions on the games but you'll also be hearing his comments and thoughts as well. He also sent a whole lot of design stuff and uh, behind the scenes photos so you'll be seeing those as well. You've already seen a few of them so that's pretty cool. But let's get this video rolling and jump back to the beginning. 2012 saw the release of two games. First game we're looking at here is called Wonderland. It was an action-adventure Zelda-style game that was put out for the RGCD 16 kilobyte cartridge competition. For such a small game, it's actually quite fun and plays really well. I just wish they had made an expanded version of this. I think people would really love that. I asked Trevor how he actually became involved in doing the graphics for this little gem. Georg was involved in a competition. I think it was a 16k competition and he had a top-down kind of RPG idea um, and he approached us if I asked if I was interested in doing the graphics. I didn't have much space to work with, there's hardly any any characters, hardly any sprites but um, yeah I went through and it was a good fun one to do and I think it turned out you know, really nicely for a little, little 16k game. And the second game for 2012 was the first big C64 game Trevor worked on which was Soulless which he contributed graphics to, along with Jorg Rottensteiner on code and Mikael Hastrup on the wonderful music score that you're listening to right now. It's a big sprawling platform adventure game with a fantastic graphic style, cool story with an epic intro and ending, and feels like one of those great early 90s C64 games. If you updated your C64 Mini or Maxi recently, you'll notice that this game was one of the new additions, so there's really no reason not to try it out. And here's the original map that Trevor designed for the game, and I asked him, as the game is pretty big in scope, how long was the development cycle for it? Um, we already had a nice editor on, you know, which was used on Joe Gun, which you can make elements and you could create rooms really quickly. So the actual start of the game, you know, we went off with a flyer, we had the map done within, within about a week, maybe two weeks. And then Georg went off and he did something else. Um, I can't remember what, what else he was working on at the time. Um, and then this, that sort of went into a few months, four or five months, we didn't do anything on it. And I sort of thought, well, that's it, you know, let's just leave it behind now. And then one day he just came back and he says, oh, he has a demo. And I had a look and he had the platform engine in, you can explore the rooms and it was great. So from that point, you know, we got it done really quickly. 
think within a couple of months. So from start to finish, it was maybe about a year, six months in the middle, where you know we didn't really work on it. 2013 saw the release of two games. This year saw the release of two really fun games that clearly took the inspiration from TV shows such as Miami Vice, one of my personal favorite shows of all time, and the more contemporary Supernatural. So let's first look at Vice Squad, which is a fast-paced top-down spy hunter mixed with a bit of Chase HQ style game, where you play a pair of Crocodile Tubs Vice Cops blasting bad guys and smashing them off the road to complete levels and missions. Trevor did the graphics and game design with Akam Volkers on code and Linus providing the pumping music score. It's a pretty underrated C64 game worth checking out. The other release was Guns and Ghosts, a game whose story is clearly supernatural inspired. It's another great little action platform game that has you taking out zombies with your twin barrel shotgun and was the first new era C64 game I played after getting back into the Commodore game and starting this channel. It's got a cool intro and another great music track by Richard Bayless and all these games can be purchased from Sartronic Software. I asked Trevor as a game designer how influenced is he by other media in his own game. So with the Vice Squad I was also a fan of Spy Hunter and the Arcades so I wanted to you know make something like that something along those lines but instead of having it scrolling it vertically I wanted it you know, horizontal um, and it was heavily influenced by Miami Vice obviously and each, each of the roads was made out of tiny little, se little sections two screens along I think there were and then you could add them all together in different ways you know like a jigsaw and that was really fun to do the music on that was absolutely fantastic and then with Supernatural Georg had been working on it for quite a while and then I came in and I redid the art you know the sprites in the backgrounds you know we thought maybe it's a bad idea I have a call after a TV show <laughs> so um chucked around a few names and Guns and Ghosts came up and we both liked it so yeah so that's what it ended up staying as 2014 saw the release of one game this year we got one game but boy is it a good one darkness is in essence an epic ode to ultimate play the games 80s adventure game saber wolf you're an adventurer whose plane has crashed in the jungle and your girlfriend has gone missing it's your job to find her in this maze of jungle and temples it's a hundred screen adventure that has light puzzle elements lots of blasting action and has really nice lush graphics by trevor a nice big map which this is his original map design as well for the game and coded and scored by the vast squad team of Volkers and Linus respectively. Whether you're a fan of Saber Wolf or not, this is totally worth a play. Also, if you got the cartridge version of this game, you got a bonus game called Darkapede, which is a fun little centipede style variation set in the darkness universe to have a little bit of fun with. I asked Trevor about his odes to classic games, whether he's trying to improve on the originals because he wasn't satisfied with them, or whether he's trying to introduce these classic styles to new C64 gamers. So a lot of games that I like to do and design are games in, in the style of things that I've really loved playing in the past you know it's like I love Draconis and I loved Apostle Mission so I did my kind of take on that with Solus and then obviously with Darkness it was Sabre Wolf. Strange thing with Darkness originally me and Stu were doing it for mobiles so it came out on, on iPhone and Android and I did all the art in 64 style so I just approached Achim and said you know do you fancy doing this on the 64 and he was like yeah sure that would be great and we were going to include the map but unfortunately we didn't have the memory so the original Android one had a, an in-game map that you could access so like these games aren't my aren't me trying to make them better than the original because I don't think the originals need to be made better you know I love the originals it's just my take on that style of game 2016 saw the release of one game next up we got my life which is a fun arcade style game similar to the arcade Mikey where you have to get Eugene to survive one week in his life so he can have a rest on the weekend it's fast-paced fun as you collect letters to form words which enabled you to escape a level. Extremely colorful graphics with a great high res look, code by Volkers, and another banging Soul Cross soundtrack that's as bubbly as you can possibly get, and is still some of my favorite tracks of his that he's ever done. I asked Trevor about the making of My Life. I always loved those early Imagine games, you know, with the yellow box art. And like really cartoony with Mr. Wakelin artwork on the front, you know, like Mikey and Comic Bakery and those kind of things. So I, w I wanted to come up with an idea of something along those lines. Um, and Mikey was, you know, was a fun one. Um, but I thought, 
you know, let's make him older with no hair and a bit larger around the middle, as, as happens to most of us. So I designed, it, came up with the game and, and all the artwork in the rooms and everything. And I think it was really quickly, it was about a week or a week and a half. And then I s- spoke to Achim Valkas, um, who I'd worked with on Vice Squad and Darkness already, and said, um, you know, do you fancy doing this one? And he was he was interested. You know, that seemed to come together really quickly. It was from start to finish, it was maybe two or three months. Yeah, that was really fast to work on. Music wise, spoke to Soul Cross and I asked him if he could do something in that imagined style. You know, the kind of loading, the ocean load, that sort of music where it was really jarry, um, Jean Michel jarry. And he came up with that and it was, you know, it was absolutely brilliant, absolutely brilliant music. So that was that was a real good fun one to do that one. 2017 saw the release of six games. 2017 has a familiar start with Rob's Laugh, which is basically a mod of My Laugh, put out as a bonus for the Project Hubbard Kickstarter campaign, celebrating Sid composer Rob Hubbard's career in game music. The game is exactly like My Laugh, except Rob's in it, and Ben Daglish, and various other C64 characters make an appearance. And what would a Hubbard game be without music by Rob himself, which he also composed? Awesome. Next was Downhill Challenge, a cool little epic style skiing game made for the Forum 64 and Protovision game competition, which Trevor did graphics for. It's fun and addictive and reminds me of those old Atari games, just with way better graphics and audio. Barnsley Badger was next, an excellent take on the Monty on the Run styled UK platform games of the mid 80s, which I absolutely loved. Volkers was back for coding, with Andrew Fisher joining for an excellent soundtrack, and Trevor again on design and graphics, with another epic map as seen here. I asked him about adapting different graphic styles for different games, and he said, I've worked in the games industry since the mid 80s I did my first sprites for Tinesoft it was on a Winter Olympics game on the Commodore 16 I believe and then since then you know I've worked for US Gold um, I've did a game for Ocean I worked for like, Acclaim and Iguana I've worked on a few titles for Team 17 so your styles your styles really change art, art wise you know you have to do horror then you have to do cartoony and sports and things so that's spread into the 64 development. Um, when I come up with a game idea, the first thing I do is the main character. So the style is, yeah, that's that's right at the beginning. It doesn't evolve as as the game goes on. It's That's kind of the first thing that I come up with. Next up was The Sky Is Falling, a very addictive five minute style Twitch game that I love messing around with. You basically have to survive being crushed by a giant Indiana Jones type rock, as well as the cave falling on your head. It's kind of one of those see how far you can get games. Trevor did graphics with Stuart Collier on code and Richard Bayliss back again for some tunes. Next was Bear Beware or Sleepwalker as it's also known which is a very underrated C64 game that mixes elements of Jet Set Willy and Lemmings as you try to guard the little bear to bed without getting him murdered. It's very unique and fun and well worth a look, with Trevor again providing the lovely high res graphics and box art. And the final game for 2017 was Argus, a big old epic dungeon crawler that harkens back to games like Eye of the Beholder or Dungeon Master from the 80s, with light RPG elements. It's a big and sprawling game, which led me to ask him about the making of Argus. I like to work on all, all different styles of games, and I was a, I was a huge fan of Obitus, if you, if you remember that one on, on the Amiga when I was younger, and I thought would it be possible to do something kind of in that style on the 64? So I had to play around with it, doing it in character mode, um, squeezing all the all the movements of the corridors and you know things into into one character set. And he, yeah, it sort of worked. So I spoke I spoke to Akin Volkas and I said, "Do you fancy having a bash at this one?" We'd already done a few games together already, so he's always interested. Um, and he was, "Yep." Yeah, yeah, that you know that looks really good. Let's let's give it a go. And I think it had fifteen hundred locations. So when we had to test that one, it was it was a real slog because we had to make sure that every room linked up to all the all the correct rooms. And then I spoke to Soul Cross again. Do you fancy having a bash of the music? And he was, yeah. Yeah, of course. And I asked for the music in the style of Master of Magic, something along those lines, and you know he came up with it, and it was great. So that took quite quite a while to test. I just remember looking at the map and all those numbers, and just say, right, come on, let's get on with it. Let's get a test of the game. So that took yeah, that that took quite a long time to get done. 2018 saw the release of three games. This year's releases were all vastly different from each other, yet all quality in their own right. First up is Rocky Memphis and the Legend of Atlantis, which is an 
excellent flip screen action adventure game that's really quite unique. It's a bit Indiana Jones and a whole lot of Rick Dangerous as you solve puzzles while avoiding traps. If I had done a top 10 C64 games of 2018 list back when I started this channel, this would have been number one. Top quality presentation, a tough but fair challenge, great story and more awesome tunes from Soul Cross. It's a must play C64 game for sure. Next was Organism, a game that oozes the style of the Aliens movies, as it's an action adventure exploration type game as you search a giant spaceship trying to find a way to escape as it's slowly getting infested by aliens. It's fun and different, and I just love the graphic style and creepy music. It's just another all round quality title. And I asked Trevor if it's his intention to always try out different gameplay styles in his designs for new games. I think we all like to work on different styles of games. It just keeps everything fresh, you know, that you're making something different each time. I wouldn't want to be stuck in the rut of just doing platform games. Um, even though we do love doing them, it, it is nice to try a hand at something a little bit, little bit different every now and again. And the last game for this year was Sizzler, which was a game made in conjunction with the Zap64 annual Kickstarter. The game is a tough as nails flip screen platformer, where you are collecting data for a new game and returning it to the Archon64 guys to put the game together and hopefully win a Sizzler award in Zap64 magazine. Yeah, it's as meta as it can get. Awesome graphics and world design by Trevor, with Stuart Collier on coding and Soul Cross again with the tunes. It's a pretty cool game that's only really let down by its extreme difficulty, or at least I found it bloody hard. I asked Trevor how he met Soul Cross, as he's such an important element of the Archon 64 brand. So the reason that we came to work with Soul Cross as much is I was working on an idea for a, like a Metroidvania style game, which was Hyperion, and I designed it and had all the mapping, all the sprites done and everything. I stuck some mock screenshots up on Lemon 64. Um, at the forum and you know he saw them and he was interested in doing the music I think in the end he did about 16 tracks for that and they were, they were all really good you know really good piece of music but unfortunately the game hit some snags and we ended up dropping it which is a real shame maybe we'll get back to it one day um, I would like to but yeah that's that's how we came to work with Soul Cross 2019 saw the release of three games first up is Chaos Generator a cool variation on Pac-Man it's simple fun as you have to collect all the music notes that your producer lost before the magnets get to them and erase all your band's songs. It's got that simple styled spectrum high res look, the same graphics that was used in Organism and I really like this style. It was also coded by Stuart Collier and Andrew Fisher makes a welcome return for another set of bopping cool audio tracks. If you like Pac-Man then you'll like this. Next was Run Demon Run, a surprisingly good endless runner style game. The reason I say surprising is because I'm really not a fan of this type of game at all, but for whatever reason I found myself playing this way more than I thought. The C64 has very few of these style of games and its combination of cool graphics by Trevor, coding by Volkers and Richard Bayless pumping out more earworm tunes. It's just totally one I'd recommend especially if this style of game is up your alley. I asked Trevor where he met Coda, Stuart Collier and whether working with a small group of people helps making these games easier to produce. So I worked with Stu originally we uh, made a retro remix of of old games, you know, so we did a remake of Armalite, for example, and Dan Dare, and you know, we did, did like we even did an online Jet Set Willy, which for a while it was it was good fun. It was good fun. There was quite a few people playing it. But then I moved on to you know working on the 64 again, and I didn't really have the time to do retro remakes. And I I was always asking him to join, but he was he was I don't think he was that interested for a while. And then I'd I'd had a few games out. I'd spoke to him again, and he said, "Okay, I'll you know let's give it a go." So we ended up doing the skies falling. You know, he picked up really quickly how to, how to code on the sixty four. It was amazing, and it's nice to work. You know, I work with him a lot, and I work with Achim Volkers a lot, and Georg Rottensteiner, and it's nice to work with the same coders over and over again because you know that you know the strengths, and you you work well with each other, and they don't mind us hassling them every other day. Is is it done yet? Have you fixed this yet? Etc. So yeah, so it's really good fun working with the same people over and over again. The last game for 2019 was Age of Heroes, a brilliant side-scrolling hack and slash affair along the lines of Rastan Saga. I played the heck out of this game and enjoyed it so much. It has a massive map where you can take on levels in any order you feel like it, nice big chunky boss fights, tons of graphical variety in the stages and enemies, and the difficulty balance is just right. It really is a cool hack and slash which is a genre the C64 has never been particularly great at, generally speaking, but this sits right up there with the best of them.
him. I asked Trevor about how Age of Heroes came to be. With Age of Heroes, I'd always wanted to make a hack and slash game along the lines of Rast and Saga, uh, but instead of having an eight-way scrolling, it would just be left to right. And I wanted to make it easier because a lot of, a lot of people had asked me if we could make some of our new games a bit easier for people who are playing them now. Uh, you know, their reactions had weren't quite as good as they were when they were younger. So yeah, so so that's how that one came about. And I was really happy with how it turned out and we got lots of great feedback on it. 2020 saw the release of three games. And for our final year of coverage, we got a triple threat of cool fantasy and horror games. First is The Lord of Dragonspire, a game that came out technically at the end of 2019, available to Zap64 2020 annual Kickstarters, but got a wide release to the masses in early 2020. It's a fantasy action adventure game with light RPG elements that follows in the footsteps of the classic C64 game Master of Magic. It's good but won't appeal to everybody, and it's a bit tough to survive the beginning until you level up a little bit. Regardless, it's another bold stab at a genre they've never done, which I absolutely love. Trevor on graphics and design, Stuart Collier on code, and Jason Page with an epic 10 plus minute SID track, which is excellent. With such a cool cover for it, I asked Trevor about his contributions to games he's not involved with but has done artwork for. Over the years, I've done all styles of art, you know, pixel art, and then level artist and concept artist, and, and that's led us to doing magazine covers and album covers and book covers. And then Georg was releasing Joe Gunn and he didn't have a cover for it and I said look I'll do I'll do your cover and then Ken's at Cytronic Software contacted us and asked us if I'll be interested in doing a few more it's, you know that's carried on I've done um, I've done tons of covers now um, a lot of games I haven't worked on um, but it's good fun and I really enjoy it next up is Isle of the Cursed Prophet a super cool Zelda style action adventure game set on an island where the goal is to resurrect your dead wife with the help of the cursed island secrets it's a great exploration game with simple puzzles and fun action. It's got nice high-res graphics and a very atmospheric score by Soul Cross. And that intro has to be one of the C64's best ever produced and sets the tone magnificently for the game to unfold. He has Trevor's original map design which shows the scope of it. I think it's a perfectly sized game, not too long and tedious, but just enough adventuring for a totally memorable experience. I asked Trevor about his love for fantasy and horror and how these three 2020 games came to be. Yeah, we had three games out this year. The first one, which was technically last year, because it was part of the Zap64 annual Kickstarter, was The Lord of Dragonspire, which is obviously a take on Master of Magic. Um, I had the graphics on my hard drive that I'd done years ago, and we just sort of sat there. I didn't think that, that I would use them. But then we were asked if we could do a game for the Zap Kickstarter, and I thought, yeah, that one would be great. And Stu was up for it again, so we did that. And then Jason Page did the music, and an absolutely amazing piece of music. So that was a real good fun one to do. And then with the second one, Shadow of a Hawk's Mill, you know, you know, I've always been into Cthulhu and that mythos, and um, I wanted to make that style of, you know, just, just something to have that kind of feel to it. So I had it based around that and then it used the engine more or less for, from The Legend of Atlantis have, adding some lightning and rain and things and just to make it nice and spooky with black shadows moving around so that round, so that that was a great one and that was music by Soul Cross again Stu did the coding on that one and then the third one Isle of the Cursed Prophet uh, I really loved the atmosphere that you got from the box art on the Spirit of Stones. Not so much the game, but the actual box art. The you know you got that huge book inside of it as well. It, it had this kind of Wicker Man feel to it. So I wanted to do something like that. So I worked on a backstory with loads of spooky tales of this stra strange little island, and had, had a real blast doing that one. It wasn't easy because it tried to fit that huge map and then all the rooms in, in, into one load was really tough. But um, yeah, we managed it and I was over the moon with, uh, you know, with how that one turned out. 
And last but very not least is my personal favourite game of the year for 2020, that being The Shadow Over Hawksmill, a brilliant flip screen horror adventure game in the HP Lovecraft mould, with elements of The Legend of Atlantis and a massive cool and intriguing story as well, and a brilliant world to explore and solve. It's just an excellent piece of work. The atmosphere with the rain and the dread-like tones of Soulcross's most atmospheric score make it a total winner in my book. Excellent graphics by Trevor as always and Stuart Collier again on coding make this just a banger of a C64 game. And for the final main question, I asked Trevor when did he actually get his first Commodore 64 and what was his first gaming experience for it? And how did he find himself developing games for an almost four decade old system? I got a Commodore 64 in about 1983 and the first game I got I think was International Soccer which I, I thought was absolutely amazing at the time. I think over the years my favourite was was Whizball because it was it was so original there was nothing like it I, d I don't think there's been anything like it since it looked great it sounded great um, you could play two players on it it was fantastic. I think over the years moving through the consoles you know and I've worked on them you know I've worked in the games industry for 30 odd years now I always missed those days, those really simple pixels, the simple backgrounds, you know, um, and I just, I really wanted to get back into it. So I believe I did a loading screen for Joe Gun in the late 2000s, which I really enjoyed doing. And then I was approached to do the sprites in the backgrounds for Edge Grinder, which was a really short game um, for a competition or something. And I really enjoyed doing that <clears throat> and relearning it again. Um, and then I had an idea for a game, which was the original Solus, which I approached Georg Rochsteiner, asked him if he fancied doing it, and he was, yeah, he was interested, so we started working on that. So that's how I got back into doing games on the Commodore 64. And if any of you guys have watched my top 10 videos from 2019 and 2020, you'll know that Archon 64 fared very well. So if you want some more information about them, please check those out. So I was also able to ask Trevor about a whole bunch of the Archon 64 games that are coming out in 2021 and here's what he had to say. Yeah we've got a few titles next year that, that'll be out hopefully. It'll be starting with Arcade Days which is a collection of 18 mini games. You know you've got like three Pac-Man style, three Space Mirror style, three Centipede style etc. And that's got a music again by Mr. Sal Cross. Actually I think, I think he's doing the music on all our all releases next year. So yeah that's out, that should be out first. And then we'll have Age of Heroes 2 and that I would imagine will be later in the year. And that's more like Rygor, you've got a larger map to explore it's more kind of you know metroidvania i guess you can unlock areas and you've, you've got huge bosses to fight that'll be later in the year and then we've got solus 2 which we seems to have been working on for for years now for, for ages but that is so close we're just working on the final boss fight and then that'll go into testing so that may be mid next year hopefully for a release and then we've got um, a dragon punch which is a kind of a Kung Fu Master style game. 10 levels, 10 bosses, lots of moves. Yeah, so that'll be mid next year probably. So there's lots to come out next year and then a lot more the year after because I've got lots more ideas that I've designed. And I hope you enjoyed that little video. I just want to thank Trevor again for granting me the interview and also providing all that cool behind the scenes stuff. I've left a link to Cytronic Software in the video description. You can get 99% of these games from there. Even if you just buy the digital version, which is only a few dollars for most of these games, it helps support the modern era of C64 gaming. So if you haven't, throw them a few bucks, you know, get some awesome, awesome games. And that's it from me, Bastish B at 64K. I hope you had a good time. If you can like and subscribe, they'll be greatly appreciated. And I'll see you next time. Cheers.